I have the privilege of being here with Dr. John Warwick Montgomery, and uh, thank you for coming to Albuquerque, and thank you for agreeing to this interview. You're most welcome. Um, I want to talk a little bit, Dr. Montgomery, just about your um, your conversion, or how you came to Christ. Um, you once said, uh, like the gr uh, late C.S. Lewis, I was literally dragged kicking and screaming into the kingdom by the weight of evidence for Christian truth. Tell us about that process. Well, I grew up in a <clears throat> early ecumenical liberal Protestant church in a small town in upstate western New York. Uh, it, I might as well have been a member of the Rotary Club uh, for all the uh, <clears throat> Bible or theology I got in this, this thing. Uh, and I went on to university at Cornell, and in my freshman year, I was in those Quonset hut dormitories that had been built for returning servicemen just after the Second World War. They had uh, kept them going, uh, and uh, the freshmen, the frosh, were there. And upperclassmen, of course, could go into the <coughs> wonderful Gothic uh, dormitories. In the dormitory where I was located, uh, there was a third-year engineering student. Uh, engineering was a five-year program at Cornell at that time, and he was a believing Christian and uh, voluntarily stayed in these dreadful Quonset <coughs> dormitories uh, in order to be able to witness to uh, other students. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> I, I think it was actually in the men's room I encountered him for the first time. <laughs> and he said, oh, what are you majoring in? I said, philosophy. He said, ah, he said, that has a lot to do with religion. I said, well, if it does, that's not why I'm majoring in it. Uh, but he persisted. Uh, and uh, his little room was stuffed with fine apologetics works. Uh, C.S. Lewis, the early broadcast talks, uh, Edward John Carnell, an Introduction to Christian Apologetics, Wilbur Smith, Therefore Stand, yes. really solid material. Uh, and uh, I discovered that my questions were trivial uh, as compared with the strength of the answers that had been provided by great Christian apologists. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, ultimately, by about Easter time in my freshman year, uh, I was down on my knees uh, being converted. Uh, and uh, it was absolutely amazing. Um, the next day, even the, the leaves on the trees were sharper. Uh, the, the sun shone <clears throat> in a way that it had never done before. Uh, and uh, uh, I was then <clears throat> involved in InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. Uh, incidentally, that engineer was Herman John Eckelman, and uh, one of my books, uh, <clears throat> the God, uh, Evidence for Faith, Deciding the God Question, uh, is dedicated to him, uh, and all of the writers are uh, scholars today who had contact with Eckelman at Cornell, and he impacted their lives. And so that book of apologetics is really a, uh, a testimony to what one person can do as a personal witness if they're willing to. Hmm. So during that time, were there, were there claims of Christ that, um, or evidences of what Jesus claimed to be that were pivotal for you? Well, uh, particularly the fulfilled prophecies and the resurrection. Hmm. Uh, it, it was clear to me, and I'm going to deal with this uh, on Wednesday night, it was clear to me that if you have a considerable number of uh, prophetic utterances from a variety of different books across many centuries of the Old Testament, and these all come to focus on Jesus Christ, on that one person in the New Testament, this is a very special kind of book, and he has got to be a very special kind of person. Uh, and uh, he made the test his resurrection, only one sign to this wicked and perverse generation, the sign of Jonah. Mm. Uh, and uh, then he demonstrated his deity by his resurrection from the dead. Mm. So during that time, when you, when you made that, that decision to follow Christ, that conversion, and you said everything was different, um, did you immediately have uh, a hunger, a thirst to know more about these evidences? I mean, were you already predisposed philosophically, apologetically, 
Did you grow from that point on in that? Well, I was double majoring in classics, uh, Greek and Latin, and philosophy. And of course, uh, in the philosophy courses, I was immediately confronted uh, with um, major systems that are contrary to uh, Christian faith. Uh, and uh, so it was necessary to deal with these. Mm -hmm. uh, my first philosophy course was with Edwin A. Burt, B-U-R-T-T, -T, the author of The Metaphysical Foundations of Modern Science, and I got to know Burt quite well. Uh, he was interesting because uh, he had been a Presbyterian clergyman, and uh, finally he could no longer believe it, and he had the intellectual honesty to get out of the Presbyterian church, and he became a Quaker, you know, where you can <clears throat> meditate on your own uh, innards, uh, <laughs> and that is <laughs> all that's really required of you. So... Um was your faith, you know, you just mentioned something about people who are in, in the clergy or in the Christian faith, and over a period of time, they, they come to a place where they can't believe that anymore. It seems to be a common journey, whether it's Bart Ehrman or others who are uh, classically trained, seminary trained. Uh, is that, uh, that's a troubling kind of a trend. You know, of course, you counter that, and you've debated such people, but, but why is that trend even there? Well, I think it's there because in our contemporary educational systems, we are not taught uh, to employ careful logic uh, and engage in disputation type situations uh, where it's necessary to face objections, work them through, mm -hmm. answer them and the like. Uh, during the Reformation period, it wasn't like that. All the great uh, confessions of the uh, Protestant Reformation have both theses and antitheses. They take up the contrary viewpoints, they analyze them logically, and they show that these will not hold water, and uh, therefore uh, one must move in the direction of the position that they're setting forth. Mm -hmm. Now, that kind of thing simply doesn't go on uh, today. Uh, and uh, the result is, uh, if you combine this with um, a misunderstanding of what tolerance involves, uh, people don't want to maintain positions that could be offensive, uh, or positions that seem to put other people at a disadvantage. Uh, I, I, and, and therefore, the, these moves away from Christian faith are not rational moves. They are, they are moves to accommodate to a different world, a different lifestyle, a different way of looking at things. Uh, and uh, they, But of course, no one wants to admit that they are changing position on the basis of that kind of thing. So uh, along with this comes rationalization. And uh, then the person goes back and tries to find problems uh, with the Bible or problems with the, <clears throat> the case for, for Jesus Christ. Uh, now, no human argument is 100% sound uh, if it deals with a matter of fact. Uh, these are always probability arguments. Therefore, as Pascal said, uh, there's enough light for anybody who wants to see, and there's also enough darkness for anybody who has a contrary disposition. If, if for any reason you don't want to accept uh, Jesus Christ, you can find reasons. Mm. They unfortunately are not good reasons, but you can certainly find reasons. Right, so you're saying that people will become intellectually dishonest for social reasons, social purposes, to fit in or to not be offensive. Yes, although I wouldn't go so far as to use the expression intellectually dishonest for them. I think that this is a matter of self-deception. I, I, I think it's it, 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 they, they get to the point where they psychologically and sociologically can't maintain this Christian position any longer. They are, for example, in a secular university where 90, 95% of the faculty are dead against Christianity or don't care about Christianity, and they uh, are in the university pecking order. Uh, they desperately want to uh, reach the level of an associate professor and tenure security and all this kind of thing. All of these pressures work on them, and when suddenly uh, a switch is tripped and they move into unbelief, because <laughs> you don't logically do that, uh, what they have to find are some reasons against Christian faith, and then they, 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 they do this. But, but they are not consciously, I think in most instances, being intellectually dishonest. Now, there are some who are. No question about that. Okay. So you mentioned uh, the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Would you give just a concise kind of a 
an outline of that evidence? Well, over a 40-day period, uh, this man, who had unquestionably uh, died on the cross, been executed under the auspices of a Roman crucifixion team that knew its business, this man uh, was uh, alive again and uh, engaged in physical activities that demonstrated that this was not a vision but an actual resurrection. Uh, for example, uh, <clears throat> Doubting Thomas, he won't believe in spite of the fact that his fellow uh, apostles have seen the Lord. Uh, Jesus appears to him and allows him to touch his hands and put his hand into the wound in his side, this sort of thing. And on the road to Emmaus, uh, Jesus is eating fish with his disciples. Uh, now, <clears throat> there's no way in the world that one can uh, uh, argue uh, that this is a, a vision, you know, a collective hallucination or anything like that. It doesn't work that way. And St. Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 uh, says, uh, after he's listed people who had contact with the risen Christ, uh, that uh, there are over 500 uh, witnesses uh, to this who are still alive. His point being, he wrote that, by the way, in 56, so that's within a generation of the crucifixion in 30. Uh, it, it's perfectly obvious that, that he's presenting this as a public event that can be checked out simply by talking with the people who had contact with the risen Christ. Mm. Uh, let me ask you this, because I thought of him when you were talking about the miracle of the resurrection. The Scottish philosopher David Hume who said by looking, by, by what we observe, miracles don't happen. Um, corpses once dead don't resuscitate, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, you know, just by our own experience and observability, they don't happen, thus they can't happen. I think he sort of said something around those. How, how would you respond to that? Well, it's interesting that a non Christian philosopher <clears throat> a decade ago uh, did a book entitled Hume's abject failure, his argument against the miraculous. Uh, this gentleman is John Ehrman, E-A-R-M-A-N, uh, and uh, he's one of the major contributors to the Encyclopedia of Philosophy, edited by Paul Edwards. He's a major philosopher, and he points out what <coughs> everybody really has uh, realized ever since Hume's argument, that the argument is perfectly circular. It's a perfectly circular argument. Hume starts out by saying there is uniform testimony against the miraculous. Otherwise, we wouldn't call a thing a miracle. And he concludes, therefore, that miracles don't occur. Now, uh, we're perfectly willing to admit that if no one has ever seen a miracle, then you can't very well affirm that miracles take place. But the whole point is that people have seen the miraculous, and therefore there is not uniform experience I against see, the miraculous. Right. And so if you want a, a general rule, uh, the rule is something like this. Uh, most people who die stay dead, uh, with one, at least one very important exception. exception. <laughs> right. And uh, we have eyewitness testimony. Sure. Okay. Sure. And it's the testimony that counts. Uh, one of the problems with professional philosophers, and I am now teaching in a philosophy department, <clears throat> so I can certainly say this, one of the problems with professional philosophers is they try to figure out ways of determining what can or cannot happen in the universe without getting off of their rear ends and going out and checking testimony. Mm. And that's exactly Hume's uh, problem. Uh, Hume said, for example, if someone comes to me and says, I have seen a miracle, I ask, would it be a greater miracle that this person is telling the truth and is not deceived or that the miracle occurred? And for Hume, because he's convinced ahead of time that no testimony can exist validly in behalf of the miraculous, for him it would be more miraculous if this person were actually telling the truth. Right. Right, right. That's his predisposition. He has just determined beforehand that sure, it doesn't exist. Sure, it's an a priori argument, and uh, and you know, no philosopher or anybody else knows the universe well enough to discount the uh, the fact that a certain thing can occur. The only way in the world you're ever going to discover whether something happens is to check it out. Mm. Check it out by observation and evidence. Let me just kind of go back to your personal life. Uh, you, you came to Christ. You were at Cornell University. Yes. And then you went on and you have 11 degrees, 
but you went on to graduate, postgraduate work. Tell us a little bit about just your educational background and the degrees that you hold. Well, the, after, <clears throat> after uh, university, uh, I went to a graduate library school at the University of California. And uh, I did this because library science is one of the most, uh, one of the broadest and most general fields. And you get into contact with, with the literature of everything that way. And I thought that this would be great. Uh, I, I didn't really practice it. I, I was a member of the reference department at the University of California at Berkeley, but when I got questions such as, where is the men's room, uh, <laughs> I decided that uh, perhaps I should be doing something a little bit more challenging, right? Uh, and uh, then I went on to theological seminary, okay? Uh, and uh, <clears throat> ultimately received an appointment as the head librarian of the Divinity School at the University of Chicago. Now, uh, the school was hopelessly liberal, uh, but the library was one of the branch libraries of the university, and uh, this was a worthwhile experience. Uh, I had graduate students uh, come to me and say, why are the books of the Bible not in alphabetical order in the catalog? I said, because we always put them in the canonical order, beginning with Genesis and going to Revelation. These graduate students had no clue as to the canonical order of the books of the Bible. They couldn't find anything. Hmm. And when I uh, talked with one of them about uh, the use of a concordance, he said, only a fundamentalist would use a thing like that. <laughs> so I called someone I knew in the English department and I said, you're a fundamentalist. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, you use a Shakespeare concordance, don't you? <laughs> 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 yeah. And then ultimately on into law primarily because it has such apologetics value. And then I found that it's a lot of fun to litigate. <laughs> so uh, there were all kinds of nice things connected with that. And law school helps one think oh, yes. deductively. Yes, it does. It does. Uh, a lot of clergy could stand a good law school uh, curriculum. So, and then from law to what? After well, uh, I, I, along the way, I took a PhD uh, at the University of Chicago. That was in uh, the history of libraries, actually, a, a historical doctorate. Uh, and uh, then I went to the University of Strasbourg in France for a theological doctorate. I wanted to go to the most prestigious uh, Lutheran university that was French-speaking. I was not interested in going to a German university because most of the hideous heresies of our time have originated in that context, and also their universities are very authoritarian, uh, and uh, that, that is not my wavelength at all. Uh, and the uh, University of Strasbourg, the Faculty of Protestant Theology, was the most prestigious, so I went there and I took a theological doctorate. Beautiful. Um, and you, so you speak French and English, right? You speak French as well as you speak English. Oh, I, yes. Yeah. Yeah, and so with, when you're when you're in Europe, you live in outside of Strasbourg. Yeah, yeah. So, so this is in a French-speaking area. It's close to the Rhine. Uh, my my German is schlecht. It, it, my German is dreadful. Okay. Uh, I mean, I can create international incidents in German, but it's not a language that I really am <laughs> <laughs> comfortable with. Okay, uh, uh, Dr. Montgomery, if you were speaking on a college campus today, what evidence would you use to provide a persuasive argument that God is relevant to man today? Well, um, I guess I would um, ask the person, first of all, why he's at university in the first place. Uh, and uh, I hope I wouldn't get the answer, because I want a good job, I want lots of money, uh, something like that. <clears throat> Going to university should mean getting a good education, becoming an educated person. And uh, I would emphasize that. Uh, there is no way one can be an educated person uh, without facing the, the God question, whether there's a God and the history of God in Western civilization, uh, namely uh, the history of Christianity. Uh, that without this, one doesn't really uh, have any clue as to why Western uh, civilization is developed as, as it is. And uh, I would <clears throat> maybe even quote Aristotle, uh, the metaphysics, uh, <clears throat> where he says uh, that it is uh, of the nature of man to want to know. Uh, the search for knowledge is vital. 
So I would try to get the person I'm talking with uh, to the point where he's willing to check out the case for Christianity. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, uh, prior to all of that, uh, I, I should emphasize, prior to all of that, I would try to find out where the person is himself personally uh, in the religious sphere. I, I don't ever uh, start out, you know, bombastically telling them what they ought to be doing. Uh, it's vitally important that they uh, express themselves sufficiently that I know where they are. But assuming that the person is at university for the right reason, then that person, it, it, the person is compelled to, to come to terms with Jesus Christ. Uh, that's an argument that Wilbur Smith used in a little pamphlet that used to be published by InterVarsity uh, Press. Uh, have you considered him? And uh, Smith starts out that pamphlet by saying, the longest biographical article in the most scholarly edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica is the article concerning Jesus Christ. You cannot consider yourself an educated person unless you know who that person is. <laughs> mm. <laughs> it seems to me that's, that's the angle. That's, yeah. that's the way in which one ought to approach it. Uh, you have spoken forcefully about Richard Dawkins' denial of intelligent design. And in so doing, you stated that this is an irrational form of atheism. Could you expand on that? Tell us about that. Well, uh, yeah, I can do this best by referring to Dawkins' biomorph analogy. Uh, <clears throat> Dawkins says, you know, in his most famous work, um, uh, uh, that uh, the, the blind watchmaker, that things do look like they are uh, intelligently designed. The, the, the universe does look like there is a watchmaker who has put this stuff together. But <laughs> he is a blind watchmaker. In other words, he doesn't really exist at all. This is not a necessary uh, point of view from which to understand the universe. Okay, so uh, he does this biomorph uh, experiment, and what he does is to put into his computer uh, nine uh, factors, and uh, these nine factors are continually multiplied. The factors represent uh, genes, all right, genes. Uh, and uh, after manipulating this stuff, uh, shapes begin to appear. These shapes can look like airplanes, they can look like uh, tall buildings, uh, they can look like human faces, and so forth. And uh, <clears throat> since it's possible to carry out a series of multiplications, uh, nine times nine, you know, you've got uh, 81 possibilities plus all of the subsequent uh, stuff uh, that, that appears. And Dawkins says, this illustrates the fact that it looks like it's intelligence, hmm. but it isn't intelligence at all. And uh, there is a book uh, on the biomorphs uh, by a computer specialist, uh, and uh, this <coughs> computer specialist uh, has uh, provided some experiments that you can do yourself uh, along these lines. And in the article that I did on this, I pointed out, uh, quoting from the computer specialist, that every one of the instructions given to you uh, to work with the biomorphs requires your human intelligence in order to understand the operation that is supposed to take place and your intelligence in bringing the whole thing about. Uh, at one point uh, in this thing, <coughs> Dawkins says, um, or either that or the computer scientist says of him, that he took his uh, uh, laptop out into the backyard and let bugs or fleas come and uh, punch keys and so forth. Uh, uh, listen, uh, uh, is anybody uh, confused on this into thinking that uh, you don't need Dawkins or any intelligence in order to provide this analogy at all? I mean, if that were the case, then why don't we just let the bugs do it all by themselves? Uh, the, the fact of the matter is that no one has ever been able to explain the intricacies of the universe uh, effectively without intelligent 
design. You can't do this. And this is obvious from the fact that the, uh, that the, uh, the non-Christian, the anti-intelligence design person uh, is going to rely on infinite time. Given enough time, you can have these changes and these developments. Mm -hmm. Listen, time is not a causal instrument at all. It merely marks the passage of events. Mm -hmm. uh, you can put a birdhouse in your backyard for millennia and it will not turn into a bird. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, they tend to decay, not get better. Exactly. The birdhouses are going to look a lot worse. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, if we were on the evolution issue, then we sure. would point out that uh, entropy <coughs> is predominant. And if there were evolution, it would be a little bump on the general downward drift, yes. <laughs> and little more yes. than that. Um, at the height of the God is Dead controversy, you debated uh, the late Bishop James Pike, who was one of the advocates of that kind well, of thing. Well, no, actually he wasn't. Uh, Pike was not in the Death of God movement. I, I did debate him, but it was Altizer, uh, the uh, Death of God uh, theologian, so-called, that I <clears throat> polished off at the University of Chicago. And tell us about that, how, how it went. <laughs> well, very interesting. Uh, Altizer had been featured in Time magazine, uh, and uh, this was really hot stuff at the time. And on a bitter February night uh, at Rockefeller Memorial Chapel, there were over 2,000 people present, uh, mm. and they were more there than came to hear Karl Barth mm. when Karl Barth made his one trip to the United States. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> Uh, this this was a, a rout. Uh, it was a rout. It was uh, it was it was so bad uh, that uh, some people quipped that God didn't die, but the death of God movement did. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my my only uh, negative, uh, uh, the only negative side of this came from Wheaton College. Uh, Wheaton College undergraduates in their paper said that I had crucified Altizer, that I just hadn't been nice to him. And, uh, uh, and, and yet Altizer respected me uh, greatly and even recommended later on uh, to Lippincott uh, that I be the editor of a series of evangelical publications uh, produced by R Lippincott. So there wasn't any problem there. Uh, but, uh, you know, among our evangelical pietistic friends, um, they are just horrified when you take somebody apart. I mean, for, in, in my view, <clears throat> bad theology is cancerous. It's cancerous, and you've got to engage in cancer surgery. You yes. do not play these things uh, as if uh, they're just different points of view. You don't mm -hmm. do that. Right. We have a good example in the New Testament, what, how Paul confronts false teachers by name as well as by doctrine, correct? Yeah, yeah. yeah so he yeah. took them on head on. In incidentally, uh, after that debate at the University of Chicago, the people who sponsored it uh, invited Francis Schaeffer to debate Bishop Pike. Mm. Uh, and they were very disappointed. Uh, they contacted me in Europe afterwards because uh, what uh, Francis Schaeffer tried to do was to love Pike back into the kingdom. And people went out after the debate and they said, well, uh, I guess the two of them really agree. They don't really seem to disagree on, on, on important fact, facts at all. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, that, that, that's not the way you do this. If, if it's someone who is, who is uh, destroying souls, as Bishop Pike was doing, you don't let him get away with it. Hmm. Uh, let's go back in time to a, 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 a person that was very prominent on the landscape, Madeline Murray O'Hare. And you had encounters with her. You had did you just have one one debate? It was a radio debate in Chicago. In Chicago, and and she, and she was pretty vitriolic in her stand oh, yes. toward Christianity, oh, trying yes. to just well, remove the discussion altogether. Oh yeah, well she was she was very obnoxious. I mean, this is the kind of atheist we need because uh, people who came into contact with her uh, would run to the cross. They, they didn't want to be like her. <laughs> All right, right. No. Oh, so terrible. So tell us about <laughs> that debate, how it went down, what it was like, the ramifications of it. Well, uh, an interesting aspect of it uh, was that her son, Murray, yes. uh, was in the studio uh, for this, uh, and at that time he had not uh, come to Christ. And I, I hope that that debate had some effect along that line uh, to get him to the, to the cross. Mm -hmm. uh, she uh, 
uh, I had not had much radio debating experience, and during the first segment of this, uh, <clears throat> she uh, started talking just before the station break and kept right on talking up to the station break uh, to make sure that uh, I didn't get into word edgewise. Well, I'm a fairly quick study, and so <laughs> That's what I did through the rest of the debate. Uh, <laughs> uh, this, this had come about, by the way, because she had had a debate on that same station with Jack Wurtson, the, um, the uh, youth evangelist of the time. Okay. I mean, he was quite elderly, but he was still doing youth evangelism. And uh, Mrs. O'Hare mentioned Josephus. And Jack Wurtson had never heard of Josephus. And uh, so the, the whole thing was, was unfortunate. And that's how I ended up on the program because people kept calling me and saying, for heaven's sake, you've got to get on this program. If you don't get on the program, the church is going to fall. <laughs> and I pointed out that the church had survived worse. Uh, <laughs> but I was on this uh, program and it was very successful. Was very, yes, so. And that's recorded, by the way. It's available on tape, the, nice. the debate. So what effects did it have in Christendom or in, in, in America or in that area afterwards? I don't really know. I get very little uh, feedback on what I do. Uh, but uh, I am told that uh, it was one of the nails in Mrs. O'Hare's coffin, uh, mm. that, it, that it had a really strong positive effect. But I have no way of knowing the reality of it. Interesting. Um, th there's what... Uh, what some have observed is a new atheism, an aggressive type of atheism uh, at work um, that wants to deny any personal expressions of faith whatsoever. Um, how do you see this playing out in terms of the church today, and what have you done to respond to it? You've already debated people like Dawkins, etc., but tell us a little bit about this new atheism. Are you familiar with that term? Uh, yes, I am. Actually, I have not debated Dawkins. Uh, Dawkins has been very careful. He has refused debates with all sorts of people where um, it's clear that he feels uncomfortable. Uh -huh. uh, but as far as the new atheism is concerned, uh, uh, their efforts are to make a public, uh, to create a public face for atheism and to provide atheism as an alternative worldview. That's what they're really trying to do. Now, in the course of doing that, uh, they occasionally try to shut Christians up. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Uh, the fact is that the First Amendment uh, to the U.S. Constitution uh, that uh, separates church and state uh, makes it impossible for them uh, to shut Christians up. If the Christians have the uh, sense uh, and the courage to get out there into the marketplace and defend the faith. Uh, I think the problem is not so much the new atheism. I think it's uh, the pusillanimous Christians, uh, the Christians in all these churches where they never uh, are taught any apologetics, any defense of the faith. Uh, the average uh, believer doesn't have a clue as to what to say to a non-Christian. Uh, that's the real problem. Mm -hmm. if, if we had solid apologetics training uh, from elementary school right on up in our churches and in our uh, parochial schools, then we'd be in a position to answer these people. Mm -hmm. For our final question, Dr. Montgomery, I just want to kind of preface it by giving my little story. When I was a brand new believer, and I had, I had been in Christ for just months. My um, uh, integrated zoology professor on the first day asked if anybody believed in God. I raised my hand. And he proceeded the whole class to try to show how my viewpoint was just an untenable viewpoint. And he just spent the class knocking anybody who had a spiritual viewpoint. So wasn't, I, wasn't he paid for teaching zoology? Exactly. Yeah. Not philosophy or, or religion. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, I was, found myself in an environment, in a UCLA program, medical program, where most of my professors were just of that stature. Well, that, that threw me in a tailspin. So I remember grabbing a little book called Evidence That Demands a Verdict and, and thumbing through it and, and becoming emboldened and wanting to engage and articulate, which I found very effective and helpful. Um, it put me right into the battle, but I kept seeing a name pop up that people were citing, John Warwick Montgomery. So you have added to the faith and bolstered the faith and helped us to articulate 
not only what we believe, but why we believe it for generations. So just on behalf of, of, of believers, including myself, thank you for, for uh, building up our faith over the years. And, All um, right, a little Latin, soli gloria deo, okay. glory to God alone. <laughs> and you've also helped us in the area of the inerrancy of Scripture. And you have a term called the fuzzification of inerrancy you, you wrote uh, on, in one of your books. Could you explain the concern that you have in, of the modern church and its view on inerrancy? Well, the, the, the modern church <clears throat> desperately wants to be accepted. And the idea of a Bible, which is totally true in its statements, whether they are theological or historical or geographical or scientific, uh, that is an uncomfortable business because it might mean that the Christian would actually have to uh, defend the Scriptures against criticism. So <clears throat> in certain evangelical circles, uh, both here and in uh, England, uh, there are liberal evangelicals who claim that the Bible is just fine as long as it's dealing with theology, uh, but uh, it isn't necessarily correct in all instances when it's dealing with secular affairs. Now, that sounds like it would be uh, a, uh, uh, an easy position. But the fact of the matter is that that position is utterly impossible. Why? Well, two reasons. First of all, uh, all areas of life interlock. Uh, the theological, the moral, the psychological, the sociological, uh, the physiological tie into chemistry, biology, physics, and so forth. Uh, our separation of secular and religious is an arbitrary separation. Uh, there aren't any actual lines drawn in the universe that, that, that uh, isolate these areas. False dichotomy. It's a false dichotomy. Uh, but for uh, Christian faith, this is particularly uh, impossible. Uh, why? Because the history uh, of God's actions, as we find those actions recorded in the Bible, is a history of God entering history. He enters history by way of prophets and apostles, and ultimately He enters it by way of His only Son. Uh, all of this takes place in history so that the idea that there can be historical errors and yet everything is okay theologically is a lot of nonsense. This simply cannot be. Uh, for example, the death of Christ on the cross, was that a historical event, therefore secular, or was it a theology, a theological event? Well, this is like if you stop beating your wife, you cannot answer that question either way, because the, the death of Christ on the cross is both historical and theological, and if it didn't take place historically, it isn't of any value theologically. Uh, so, uh, the, the, what I call the fuzzification of inerrancy is to try to say, yes, yes, I hold that the Bible is inerrant, but of course I just mean in theological or ethical or moral uh, spheres. Once you start that, uh, once you find what you consider to be errors in the secular, those are going to infect the theology as well, and ultimately you're going to end up like certain German uh, theologians uh, who uh, say that the Christ event is a mythological event uh, because otherwise uh, you would have to be able to demonstrate it in some historical sense. Mm -hmm. Speaking of inerrancy and, and, and the textual basis for our belief, Bart Ehrman's big contention is because we have no original, no autographs, uh, that you know, he believes if there's a God, God could certainly preserve Scripture, but He could also preserve the originals, which He hasn't. We only have copies. But by the way, He could also give us a third arm, which exactly. would make it possible to scratch that one place on your back you can't reach. But oddly enough, He decided not to do that. Right. So, so His argument, which <laughs> seems to be persuading a lot of people, is, is is an argument with lots of holes in it. Right? False assumptions. Oh yes. So speak to us about Ehrman's uh, way of thinking when it comes to the original autographs. Well, uh, we don't have the original autographs, the actual documents that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John prepared. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we also do not have 
the original autographs of any of the writings of classical antiquity. We don't have what Caesar put down for the Gallic Wars. We do not have Aristotle's metaphysics. We have no original autographs. And in fact, we have hardly any original autographs uh, up until modern times. Uh, we have no original autographs of any Shakespeare play, and that's 17th century, mm. right? Uh, almost no autographs of my books exist. Why? Because once the book went into print, I threw away the uh, handwritten copy in the days when I did it hand, uh, in handwriting. Yeah. And of course, I simply get rid of any electronic uh, preliminary copies once the book is published. Autographs are not a test of whether you have a valid uh, transmission of a document. The test is whether uh, you can go back from the uh, later materials, mm. examining those materials for scribal errors, inaccuracies, lap lapses, uh, problems like that, uh, and uh, by comparing the copies, uh, you finally get back to what is known as a resultant text. It's the best text having removed all of the erroneous uh, uh, stuff that scribes uh, introduced by mistake uh, or, or whatever. Variances, yeah. Okay, and that process is exactly the same for secular literature as it is for the New Testament. The difference is that in the case of the New Testament, we have infinitely more copies and therefore an infinitely greater chance of arriving at a text which is solid. Mm -hmm. So he would have to throw out an, all, an, an enormous amount of literature that Western civilization holds as... Well, see, the irony of this is his specialty is textual criticism. Mm. Uh, he was an assistant for years to Bruce Metzger at mm. Princeton. And Bruce Metzger, a fine Christian believer, uh, I knew him well, said nice things about my writings and all, all this and that. Uh, Metzger was a solid believer, and once Metzger went for his reward, uh, then his textbook is now edited <laughs> by our friend. <laughs> yes, uh, and, and the, the association of these two names on the title page, you know, would make one throw up uh, because there's, there's a s infinite distance between the two, the two gentlemen. Uh, anyway, uh, as a lower critic, uh, there's no doubt about the fact uh, that Ehrman realizes that the resultant text of the New Testament, no matter what textual theory you take, Westcott and Hort, uh, or, or, or whatever, you, you can even go back to the received text that Erasmus mm -hmm. uh, created just by going around and hunting in monastery basements for manuscripts. If you take any one of these textual theories, the overlap is something like 97%. All right, yes. and therefore the, the the questionable stuff is really trivial, and it doesn't impact any uh, Christian doctrine mm -hmm. whatsoever. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the variations are something like this: one manuscript will say Jesus and his disciples walked along the Sea of Galilee, and another one will say they walked along the Sea of Galilee where Jesus and his disciples were mentioned a couple of sentences earlier. It's that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So this is a tempest in a teapot yes. and it is no effective argument uh, against Christianity. And Ehrman has gone atheist. You know, I don't know if you heard the interview uh, that, uh, that in which he participated on issues, etc., the radio, uh, the radio station, but, but he said then, uh, on that program, he said, uh, uh, this was just before Easter, and the question was, what about the resurrection? He said, we all die and we stay dead. It's just like my cat. My cat died the other week. That's the end of the cat, and uh, therefore what we should do is to spend our short lives uh, here uh, trying to make the lives of others as, as nice as possible because that's all they're going to have anyway. Oh, it's abysmal. Oh, it's abysmal. Uh, it <laughs> Fatalistic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well and, and you know, irrational, because uh, if, as a matter of fact, there's no God and there isn't any uh, divine uh, message as to how we ought to act and how we ought to live, why should I be nice to the next guy? Uh, why shouldn't I... Uh, get all that you can get for your exactly, own personal comfort. Exactly, uh, Robert Ringer looking out for number one, uh, you know, this sort of thing. Well, Dr. Montgomery, thank you for uh, being a part of this and for injecting us with fresh hope 
and confidence in God's truth. Bless you for asking me. Thank you.